Do you think it's a moral obligation to have children then with all of this sort of folded together? I think different people have different moral frameworks they're optimizing for. I think if somebody believes that their moral framework should continue to exist into the future, 200, 300 years into the future, like gender equality or something like that, and you don't have kids, you have morally failed. If you, however, are just like, no, it doesn't matter if my belief system dies out with me, um, then yeah, whatever. You know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that your morals are wrong because I think that, that morality is one of those things where I believe that my morals are right. But uh, if I go around trying to police everyone else's morality, I'm just going to have a bad time. So that's uh, that line in the sand is one I've been really interested in playing about with. I absolutely agree that some sort of handmaid's tale future where women are kept in pens like cows so that they can keep the future of the population going is wrong. Also yeah. telling women that the only way that you can live a fulfilling life is by doing some domestic version of that also yeah. is wrong. But I can't see why there isn't any sympathy out there in the world for the reverse of this situation. What about all of the people who were told you don't need to have kids to have a fulfilling life that did want to become mothers that had their preferences nudged in the opposite direction break through the fertility window and then grieve for families that they never had. Like, where is the finger pointing going in the other direction? Because I, I don't see anybody unironically saying that women need to get out of the boardroom and get back in the bedroom to start producing more children. Like, I think that they're just saying, look, maybe you should think about the current cultural norms that are being pushed and, and take them with a big spoonful of salt. Yeah, and I think that um, a lot of statistics women just aren't familiar with, things that made my wife feel a lot more comfortable. If you look at studies, not all studies show this, but a number of them do, is that uh, parent households with two working parents, the kids actually perform better academically and have better emotional health than parents with stay-at-home. It's a small effect. But what I'm saying is, is that I think that there's this intuition that only the traditional way of doing things is correct. Um, and that the truth is, is what is correct is whatever ends up working. In, in the long term for human civilization, because nothing is really working right now. And so I just encourage people to, if they think I can't be a mom and in the boardroom, I, I would encourage you to rethink the way you're structuring your family, rethink the way you're structuring finding a partner. You know, earlier we were talking about dating markets. And one of the things that our foundation is doing is we're working to try to create and promote new types of dating apps, uh, maybe even recreate the London season, um, you know, something like that, but that travels between places like the Olympics where you have, you know, a bunch of the single people go, but there's some rules that make it harder to just uh, have a really low switching cost between partners, which is one of the big problems that we're dealing with right now. Um, so with a lot of this is about experimenting with new social technologies and understanding that there probably are ways to have it all, much more than I think people want to... It, except because it requires trying new things and being called a freak by other people. What about people that say it's too expensive to bring a child into this world? Why, why are poorer people having more kids? If, if it's an issue of cost, then uh, you, what you should see is a line where people have more kids the more money they have, but typically the line goes in the other direction within and between countries until you get to like ludicrous levels of wealth, like half a million dollars a year. So um, what I'd say is it's enormously expensive. It is a massive lifestyle sacrifice. It absolutely is a lifestyle sacrifice. But is it too expensive? I think that's the real thing. Is it too expensive? Is it that you can't afford it? Or is it that you would need to, like us, you know, we had to leave a city, we moved to a rural area, we changed the type of jobs we could get because of that. You know, we made a lot of sacrifices to do this. Um, and I understand that for, for families in less socially, economically advantaged positions, they have to make even more sacrifices. Um, but, uh, you know, when a family decides they want a lot of kids, they do it. And I think in addition to that, this is another area. One of the projects that we worked in was Project Eureka, which was a town for like single moms that had kids and other people who had kids and who wanted to co-raise kids because there are social technologies we can try. And I would really like to see these commune systems and stuff like that begin to pop up more because I think as an investment prospect, they are a really good long-term investment prospect. If you look at the model that I was talking about earlier. The challenges of the, the the reason that people say it's too expensive to bring a child into this world, I don't think that they're talking about the cost on their finances. I think they're talking about the cost on their freedom. Oh, and yeah. you know, it, it's if you look at the reasons that are given 
for a lot of non-daters at the moment, for people that are checking out of the dating market. It's just got better things to do, not wanting to lose personal freedom. There's this huge, huge study that was done by Pew, and uh, it just came back that people were just distracted. So what it seems is that if you are more financially enabled, there are more things that you can do with your finances which means that you can go abroad to Bali. Why not go to Bali for two weeks? Well, if you have the kid, you can't go to Bali for two mm-hmm. weeks. That The girl with the list thing, which you must have seen that came off TikTok, a girl printed out 350 reasons not to have a child and then printed them all on a piece of paper. And the, the reasons ranged from stuff like child is literally a parasite inside of you to <laughs> can't wear my cute high heels anymore, can't do brunch on Sundays. Yeah. So I want to get into this. I'm really excited. So there are, I think, two core reasons that people don't have kids within the category that you're talking about here. It's because they're optimizing for their personal happiness. Now, this can be broad satisfaction, contentment, whatever word you want to use, but it's some sort of emotional optimization or they're optimizing for their own position within a local status hierarchy. This can be showing off to people on Twitter or whatever, you know, the trips that you're doing or the things that you're doing with your life because you think that these make you, I don't know, like better or higher within some some group. As soon as you're not optimizing for one of those two things, typically having kids, or I suppose you could say that I'm trying to make the world a better place uh, along some sort of framework like donating to like protecting ecology or something like that. Like A lot of that loops back to status though. Yeah, a lot of that loops back to status. So I think what we're going to see, and this is really cool because it's going to change what it means to be human. When people, I mean, even more than the other options people have right now, when robosexuality, I always go back to the future Futurama episode about this, that, that it predicted this. When people can start dating AIs and you can have your deep fake girlfriend and stuff like that, and then eventually people will be able to go into pods and live any virtual reality lifestyle they want. When these sorts of things become possible, and they likely will within my grandkids' lifetime at least, if not our own, pretty much everyone who's op- optimizing for status or personal pleasure is going to be culled from the gene pool. And any cultural group that can't motivate people to optimize for something else is going to be removed from the system. And that is going to fundamentally change what it means to be human and likely have a pretty big impact on sort of the human sociological profile in terms of the genetic screening that's going to cause. Mm, It's going to nudge the genetic disposition because the only cohorts that are left are going to have a particular type of predisposition. And yeah. over time, that's going to, right? Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Because, you know, we all have this this balance between hedonic pleasure and meaning that we seek in the future. You know, it's m- most parents, I don't think, if you were to test them on a minute-by-minute minute basis, it's not the most pleasurable thing in the world to raise a child. So looking at some of the, the studies that I've seen, it's not it's not massively pleasurable, but it's incredibly meaningful. And, you know, there has to be some sort of a spectrum where on one side, someone lives for a life that in retrospect, they're glad they lived. And on the other side, someone lives a life that moment to moment, they're happy that they're living. And, you know, that spectrum between the two, am I living for a future that's meaning or am I living for a now that's pleasure? Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, I love what you're getting at here, which is how do you balance these two? And the really cool thing is that biologically, we're already optimized to have kids. And I think a lot of the unhappiness that comes in society today is that people forget that all of your ancestors had kids. They had sex and they had kids. They're almost all of them did, right? Um, and so humans are programmed to find genuine contentment and happiness of a deeper kind and a more meaningful kind than they can get from almost anything else from continuing down the path that had led to our species being successful so far. And I think when you look at a lot of influencers right now, if you look at a lot of unhappiness, they are showing people what people are sort of biologically optimized for right after they go through puberty without people realizing that that optimization program changes as you get older. Often uh, there was a joke that I got in trouble for on, on, on Twitter which is to say that, I don't know if you know Blippi, he's like a Blue's Clues sort of character who dances around around fire trucks for kids and is like, yeah, I'm driving a fire truck. I'm, I'm playing in a dump truck. I'm, I'm playing on a playground, you know? And kids are like, oh, this is the perfect life before they go through puberty. They see this. That's what they're optimized for. They're optimized for play and exploration. As an adult, you see this and you're like, oh my God, his life looks terrible. Um, I mean, obviously he probably makes a lot of money, but I mean, you wouldn't actually want to live that way. And I often argue that, that Andrew Tate is sort of the Blippi for teenagers. 
Um, this is what a teenage boy thinks is the ideal adult life. But to an actual like grown man, you see this and you can see sort of the, the deadness within his eyes. And he's like, yeah, I have to like please multiple women a day or they'll leave me. And then I won't be able to maintain sort of the thing that I built up. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't even imagine like having to just like have a routine of constantly having sex every day so that I can at a base level maintain my economic empire. Um, and But to a young boy, this sounds, oh, that's the best. Because humans go through a second puberty when they have kids. Your testosterone drops dramatically. You begin to gain happiness from different sources. And it's a deeper kind of happiness. And, and with young women, it's the same thing. With young women, they get told, oh, you're going to love traveling the world. You're going to love a certain point. This stuff just becomes droll, you know? Um, because you were biologically programmed to want to... Now, not everyone is. You know, people's biological programming is a bit different. You know, I can say that on average, human males are biologically programmed to find human females attractive. But obviously not all human males find human females attractive. So a few people don't go through this shift later in life. But when you optimize around the things that give you happiness when you are a teenager and your whole society tells you to optimize around those things, you hit middle age and you're like, why doesn't anything really make me happy anymore? Why aren't video games making me happy anymore? Why aren't the, the things I used to do? Why does these status games not make me happy anymore? And it's because your culture used to tell you, hey, you need to move on to your next stage of life, but you don't have that culture anymore because you're in this bubble. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.